Good morning, church, and welcome to another virtual service here at Hope Chapel in Hermosa Beach. It's 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, and we're thankful to give God glory. Welcome to you. We, I also want to welcome those of you who are tuning in to our live Spanish translation. L welcome to you. Let me go ahead and pray, and then we'll continue with our worship service. So I invite you to join me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, and we acknowledge your grace on us this moment. Thank you, Lord, that we can come together uh, through this service and gather, though apart, we gather virtually to honor you, to worship you, and to seek your face. God, may you be glorified in all that we do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church. Let's worship the Lord together. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great. How great is our God. With the name above all names. You're the name. Lost 
its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. It's hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body
shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity. God, God in three persons, blessed Sing it out. God, you raise. 
we come humbly before you this morning to worship you, placing our trust in you, placing our trust in that name above all names, the name of Jesus. You are holy and you are worthy to be praised this morning. We thank you. We pray, God, that you are glorified this morning with our worship service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church. Well, welcome once again. We're so glad that you've chosen to tune in and worship with us this morning. We pray that you're encouraged this morning. Now, I ask that you keep your attention on the screens as we share a video with this week's announcements. Hello and welcome. My name is Jared Blue, and I'm the Community Life Pastor here at Hope Chapel. Whether this is your first time with us or you're a regular attender of our Hope Chapel live stream, I'd like to take this opportunity to personally welcome you. We live stream our worship services every Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Hope Chapel is a Bible teaching church located in Hermosa Beach, California. Our ministry philosophy is to win souls to Jesus, equip believers in the Word of God, and then send them out to make disciples throughout the South Bay and beyond. If you'd like to know more about us, please visit our website at hopechapel.org. Every week we post a Worship Wednesday Song of Praise. It is not how many people and you a sermon reflection on Fridays. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for the latest news and updates. You can call our church office with any questions, needs, or prayer requests Tuesdays through Fridays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Our phone number is 310-374-4673. You can also send us an email at info at hopechapel.org and any prayer requests to prayer at hopechapel.org. Join us for Hope on the Highway. We invite you to gather with us on Saturday evenings at 5 p.m. for church outdoors. Bring your own blanket or chair and Bible and make sure to bring your mask. Families with young children are welcome. The weather is starting to cool, so dress accordingly. Bring jackets and blankets to keep you warm. We have expanded our capacity to 130 persons. You may reserve your space beginning Tuesday at 12.01 a.m. every week for the following Saturday service at hopechapel.brushfire.com forward slash worship. If you need assistance with your reservation, you may contact our church office at 310-374-4673 Tuesday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We will continue to live stream our services on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. For more information, please visit hopechapel.org forward slash hope at home. We hope to see you there. We are in need of volunteers. Our youth ministry is growing and we are calling on any faithful men and women who would be willing to help disciple the next generation of believers. Here's a special message from our youth pastors, Nick Turner and Emily Jones. Hey everyone. Right now we are standing in the Hope Chapel parking lot. Every Tuesday night, this place is filled with youth. And for the past seven years, Emily and I have been doing everything we can to win junior high and high school students to Christ, equip them with the Word of God, and then send them out into college to make disciples of all nations. And right now, we're looking for more leaders. 70% of Christian youth walk away from the faith after high school, and we're here to combat that through intentional discipleship. So if you're a mature believer, we want to invite you to join us in that mission because 85% of believers came to the faith before the age of 18. A common misconception about youth ministry is that youth is the church of tomorrow. And we want to tell you that youth is actually in church today. We have students that are living out their faith, that they are advancing the kingdom and making disciples right now. And we need older men and women to come alongside them. So if you're interested, please send us an email at nick.turner at hopechapel.org or emily.jones at hopechapel.org. We hope to see you here on a Tuesday night. Our Hope on the Streets outreach is also in need of volunteers. Join Abraham in ministering to the local needs of the El Camino Village community. Every month, the group serves a warm meal, distributes clothing and groceries, provides haircuts, organized children activities, and on the fourth Saturday, host a service including worship and the gospel message. The need for various gifts and talents vary from worship, cooking, sorting, haircuts, childcare, Spanish speakers, and much more. Contact Abraham Sutano at hopeots2013 at gmail.com or call 310-800-0029 to learn more. 
Our next outreach event is Saturday, September 26th. If you don't know where to begin serving the church or community, give Hope on the Streets a try. This fall, our Hope Chapel Ministry Institute, better known as HCMI, will be offering two classes, Romans and Jesus' Life and Ministry. For class descriptions and to sign up, please visit hopechapel.org forward slash register. Lastly, let's continue to celebrate some special moments and milestones with our Hope Chapel family. Today we congratulate Richard McKinney and Jean Ping Gu on their baptisms last week. Also, Hunter and Caroline Threlkill recently celebrated their wedding. We wish them all great blessings. After today's message, we will take communion together. You may use any crackers, bread, and juice you have available at home. This is a good time to prepare your communion elements if you haven't already. Before we take communion, we would traditionally bring our tithes and offerings, but since we are not currently gathered in the church building, you can still give in a number of ways. Online at hopechapel.org forward slash give. Text give to 310-388-3448 or utilize our Alexio community app or by mail to 2306 Pacific Coast Highway, Hermosa Beach, California, 90254. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you have truly been blessed and encouraged by our time of worship together. Greetings, Hope Chapel. Good morning. Welcome back to Hope at Home for our 11 a.m. live stream. Uh, For those of you who might be tuning in for the very first time with us this morning, my name is Mike Nazarian. I have the great privilege of serving as one of our teaching pastors here at Hope. Church, before we dive into the message, I just want to draw your attention to a little family business, a little announcement. Uh, Many of you knew and loved Sylvia Arenas, a dear sister, longtime member of our church family. She has gone home to be with Jesus, and we will be remembering and celebrating her life uh, next Saturday, uh, the 26th at 11 a.m., right out front in our parking area adjacent to Pacific Coast Highway. So uh, on behalf of Joseph, and Sylvia's family, um, and those closest to her in our body, if you would like to come and celebrate her life with us, then you can go onto our website, hopechapel.org forward slash register, and please register to come uh, attend her memorial. And we would just humbly ask uh, that you please be prepared to have your temperature taken, um, to bring a mask, uh, please bring your own chair, and just please be understanding that we are still operating under all the covid Uh, constraints. Thank you so much. Okay, well, this morning we are concluding our series through Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. We are finishing 1 Corinthians, so I want to invite you, uh, without any more delay, to open your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and to read along with me what Paul writes as he finishes this letter, uh, beginning in verse 13. Paul writes this, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Priscilla and Pris- Achilla and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Church, this is the word of the Lord. So as I was uh, meditating on this passage, um, praying on it, thinking this week, Um, I was reminded of Paul's words to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul 
uh, instructs Timothy that um, if anybody desires or aspires to the office of overseer, to a position of leadership in Christ's church, that that person must manage his household well and his children must be submissive to him. And there's good reason for this, uh, since pastoring a church is very much like pastoring your family. If you can't do the smaller thing faithfully, you won't do the larger thing faithfully. So this is something that I personally think about a lot and have thought about a lot as a pastor's son, who is now also a pastor dad. But I know that I speak for all of us who are parents when I say that parenting, like shepherding, is a constant, continual state of teaching, correcting, instructing, and even disciplining our children. Uh, my, my parents still joke with me that their job never ends. But my point is this, uh, as parents, we are always pouring in to our children. But then are, there are these moments uh, where our kids have to either sink or swim. Now, how do we approach those moments as parents? <clears throat> uh, just two weeks ago, my kids uh, started their new school year. And um, by God's grace, the school they're attending um, offers a daycare program. So they actually have to go be in um, a classroom environment. And this was the first time that we had dropped both of our kids off at the same school together. Zachary and Zoe were so excited. <clears throat> and, you know, as Jackie and I are driving them to their first day of school, we're getting closer to the school as we're pulling up to the school. I'm talking to the kids. Um, I'm rehearsing in the most concise possible way all the things that Jackie and I have been teaching them as we've been trying to raise them um, in, in a godly manner. Um, but I'm like talking to them. I'm cramming, like packaging everything that we've tried to teach them together in this one little moment you know, as we get ready to open the door and, and send them off as they're escorted to their, their first day of class. And so in this moment, I'm giving these summary instructions to my kids. Guys, Zachary, Zoe, be leaders, not followers. You choose your friends. Don't let your ch- friends choose you. Listen to your teachers. Honor God. Be kind. Share. I think the passage that we're concluding with, that Paul concludes with, is very much like that. Um, Paul's closing his letter. um, And in his case, he doesn't know if he's going to see the Corinthians again, though he'd like to. Uh, He doesn't know if he's going to correspond with them again, though he will. So his sense of urgency is high here at the end of his letter. And as if he is a parent sending them off, knowing that it's sink or swim time, he gives them like a final push, a final picture of what they need to be as they go forth, if they're going to be a healthy church. So Paul begins this ending with words of exhortation and words of encouragement. I just want to offer um, a quick uh, heads up. So if you're looking at your notes, you'll notice there's a Roman numeral one and a Roman numeral two. We're going to spend most of our time this morning on Roman numeral one, There's just so much gold to mine out of the first half of this passage. So just for your information, Paul begins with a series of exhortations in verses 13 through 14. Um, And we need to be clear that these are exhortations. Paul's not signing off here uh, with just casual suggestions. For Paul, these are very much imperative. Now, at first glance, we'll read verses 13 and 14 And they might seem like standard issue exhortations. They might seem like words that he could give uh, to any church. But remember that Paul's aim in this letter has been to confront and correct an unhealthy church. Um, And so uh, this is essentially what he's been saying this whole letter. He's been following this pattern. He's saying, guys, a healthy church doesn't believe this. Rather, it believes this. A healthy church doesn't behave this way, rather it behaves this way. And so right here at the end, Paul is kind of distilling 16 chapters of correction and teaching down into one final laser-focused series of commands. He's packaging everything that he has written into this final concluding charge to give to his spiritual children. Look with me at verses 13 and 14. He says, 
Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. I think that there's two main truths that we can draw out of Paul's commands here. And the first is that healthy Christians last. In other words, healthy Christians make it to the finish line. Paul's writing to the Corinthians, and he knows that they're not on a lasting trajectory, they're on a losing trajectory. And so we should be asking as we read Paul's words, how do we last as Christians today? Well, First, Paul says, the Christian who lasts must be ready. So, if we're, if we're to last, we must be ready. Now, some of your translations might say, be watchful or watch, be alert, be on your guard, keep your eyes open. And those are all great translations. The word that Paul uses here is a word that's used about 22 times in the New Testament. And it's used most often in reference to Christians being spiritually awake and alert, as opposed to being spiritually indifferent, apathetic, or listless. So the central idea that Paul is conveying in this first command is the idea of readiness. I want us to think about this idea of readiness for just a moment before we go further. Uh, when I was a young boy, my parents had me in sports a year around. You know, it was soccer season, then Little League baseball season, then, you know, basketball season, and, you know, just round robin every year. And I loved playing all those sports, but probably my least favorite sport to play, if I'm honest, was baseball. Loved to watch it, didn't love to play it. I got beaned by the pitcher too many times as a kid. But here's the thing. When I played Little League Baseball, I often got stuck playing the outfield. And there's nothing that is more boring than the life of a Little League outfielder. You don't see much action in the outfield. And consequently, it's so easy to lose focus. I remember being a kid and like, you know, throwing my hat up in the air and catching it or throwing my glove up in the air and, and catching it or, you know, twirling around or, you know, laying on the ground. And I could hear my dad, you know, yelling from the stands, Mike, be ready. The point is, is that when you're in the outfield, it's really easy to lose focus. But guess what happens the moment you lose focus? That's always when the ball is hit your way, right? So Paul tells the Corinthians, be ready. Ready How? Well, there's a sense in which as Christians, we need to be ready against. We also need to be ready for. First, as Christians, we need to be ready against Satan. When Peter writes his first letter, he says to his readers, he he exhorts them, he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. In other words, be ready. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour listen, we need to be clear as Christians. There is a devil. The Bible refers to him as Satan, which literally means our adversary. Um, He is real and he wants to destroy you. You must be ready. But second, we need to be ready against temptation. Think about Jesus's experience with his disciples in Gethsemane before he goes to the cross. Jesus is praying to the Father. He's preparing himself. He's processing, you know, what is right in front of him, what what he's about to go through. He comes back, and what are his disciples doing? They've fallen asleep. They're not standing guard. They're not watching his back. They've fallen asleep. Um, And so Jesus addresses Peter as kind of the first among equals amongst his disciples. And he says, he says, Simon refers to him with, you know, his earthly name, Simon are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? He says to Simon, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus tells Peter, watch, be ready. If we go all the way back to uh, the beginning of the book, if we all go all the way back to Genesis, um, we see the encounter between Cain and Abel. We see that Abel offers a sacrifice, the choicest uh, of his flock. He offers a sacrifice to God. That sacrifice is pleasing. Cain offers a sacrifice that is not pleasing. And Cain is, is upset that the Lord is not pleased with the sacrifice. And the Lord confronts Cain. And he tells him this. He says, but if you do not do what is right, 
Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. The Lord tells Cain, sin is right there. Temptation is right there. It's crouching. It's ready to pounce. And there's no coincidence. It's the very next verse that we see recorded that Cain kills his brother Abel. We need to be clear. Sin is real. Temptation is real. And it wants to enslave you. You must be ready. But third, we also need to be ready against apathy. We live in a world that threatens to dull our spiritual senses. It wants to uh, draw our attention away from the narrow path that Jesus has called us to, the path of discipleship and obedience and service. And I know, like, I could speak for myself. Um, it's easy to get lulled into a false sense of spiritual security. It's easy to let that happen. Um, to think that you are spiritually awake and alert when, in fact, you are actually sleeping. To not even be aware of your present spiritual condition in, in this regard. Now, I think a good example of this uh, is found in Jesus' words to the church in Sardis, recorded in Revelation chapter 3. Uh, Jesus speaks through John to the church in Sardis, and he says to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Wake up, Jesus says to them, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I come to you. We need to be clear that the world will hate us because it hates God. It wants to discourage us, it wants to distract us, and it wants to deter us. We need to be ready. Fourth, we need to be ready against false teachers, against false teachings. Uh, Paul instructs Timothy to be ready for those in the church who will uh, no longer put up with sound doctrine, who will turn their ears from the truth, and who will uh, gather teachers of themselves that suit their own desires rather than are committed to to uh, honoring God's desires. Uh, similarly, Peter instructs his readers to be ready for false teachers who will introduce destructive heresies, destructive teachings into the church that will potentially lead believers astray. We need to be aware false teachers exist and they want to entice us. We must be ready. But fifth, we need to be ready for Jesus. We need to be ready for his return. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, these words. He says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace, there is security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Now listen, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Let us keep awake. Church, we need to always remember, we need to always live in light of this truth. Jesus was raised, Jesus is reigning, and Jesus is returning. We must be ready. All these to say that the Christian life is not a casual life. It's not a passive life. It's not an easy life. The Christian life is a life of radical, sustained focus. We need to be ready at all times. But second, the lasting Christian must be committed. Paul says, stand firm. The idea that's conveyed by this word is to be fixed, planted, 
unmovable, firmly committed in conviction or belief. But he doesn't only say stand firm. He says stand firm in the faith. Now, when we think of faith, we could think of um, the saving faith that we possess as a gift of God. But then there's also the faith, uh, the faith that has been handed down to us, the, the, the Christian faith, um, the content of the gospel. Paul is calling for a commitment to the faith. In other words, he's saying, be committed to the truth of the gospel. Let's think about this. What are we united around as a church and as believers? We are united in and around the faith. And just like the Corinthians, when we allow our common faith, when we allow the gospel uh, to be obscured, when we make subtle compromises, that is when we open ourselves up to division. That's when we open ourselves up to to temptation. That's when we open ourselves up to error in every manner of spiritual dysfunction and disease. What was the root cause of all the unhealthy spirituality in the Corinthian church? Um, They were not demonstrating continued uncompromising commitment to the truth of the gospel. I want us to think about this for just a moment. Our behavior is always downstream from our beliefs. Our behavior is always downstream from our beliefs. In other words, um, think about how we think about God. Um, When we believe that God is holy, that's when we will value and pursue holiness. When we believe that God is just, that is when we will value and pursue justice. When we believe that God is gracious, that is when we will value and demonstrate graciousness. When we believe that God is merciful, that is when we will value and demonstrate mercy. When we believe that God is loving, that is when we will demonstrate love, and so on and so forth. In other words, our belief always precedes our behavior. Right thinking always produces right living. The Bible is clear. Satan cannot take saving faith away from us. But here's what he can do. This is what he often does. He obscures, he confuses the content of our faith, the sound doctrines of God's word. If we don't hold fast to Scripture and to the right interpretation of Scripture, we are certain to slip into wrong thinking and therefore wrong believing and therefore into wrong behavior. Third, the Christian who lasts must be brave. Some of your translations might say, act like men. Be courageous. Be brave. I'm going to use the words brave and courageous interchangeably. So this is like the only time that this particular Greek verb appears in the New Testament. And I love that Paul chooses to use it here because we can literally translate this verb, man up. He's telling the Corinthians, literally, man up, be courageous, act like men, be brave. Obviously, he doesn't want the women of Corinth to literally dress and behave like women. Rather, the idea that he's conveying um, is a life of bravery that comes from maturity, a life of courage that comes from growing up. Remember how Paul has had to speak to them uh, throughout the substance of this letter. And just to provide context and reminder, Paul was with them in person for a year and a half, these Corinthian believers. He had evangelized them. He had discipled them. He had planted that church with them. He had been with them in the flesh. Can you imagine listening to him preach in person? Can you imagine being discipled by Paul? Can you imagine planting a church with him? That's what they did with him. He was with them. He rolled up his sleeves and made it happen with them. And then um, he spends three years apart. That's when he writes this letter. He's apart from them in Ephesus. But even as he writes to them, he says that during the year and a half he was with them. He says in, in chapter three, I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not 
yet ready. That's like a double indictment. Paul's saying, I was with you a year and a half. You weren't ready for solid food. It's been another three years. It's been four and a half years total. You're still not ready. You haven't grown up. In chapter four, Paul essentially has to threaten them with discipline, like a parent would have to, you know, threaten a stubborn child. He says in chapter four, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline or with love and a spirit of gentleness? And what really captures their state as Paul sees it is what he says in chapter 14. He says, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. So he's saying to them, man up, grow up. And these are strong words from Paul to the Corinthians, but these words are appropriate because following Christ is not for cowards. That was not only true in the first century, but it's equally true today. Fourth, the lasting Christian must be strong. Paul says, be strong. And the first thing I want to point out is that the verb that he uses here, be strong, is actually passive. And what that means is Paul is literally commanding them to become strong or to be made strong. You might ask, well, how do I do that? How do I be made strong? How do I become strong in the spiritual sense that Paul is describing here? Well, I think uh, first, to answer that question, we would do well to revisit what he says to the church in Philippi. He says in Philippians chapter 4, um, I know what it is to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then he says this, we all know this verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So who strengthens us? Jesus strengthens us. But second, let's remember that Jesus himself says that our job is to abide in him, John 15. <clears throat> so we do have a job. We have a role to play in being strengthened. I remember when I was in high school, uh, you know, I had the, the desire to play um, competitive basketball at the, at the highest level I could. And I understood that in order to accomplish that objective, I had to put in the time and I had to put in the work. Um, it required discipline. It required focus. Um, and so every single off season, all summer, I lived in the gym. I'd put up hundreds of shots a day. I'd, I'd work out with a trainer. I'd, I'd get my body into the best possible shape, get stronger and stronger, you know, every year, run Sand Dune Hill in Manhattan Beach, you know, put in time on the track. But my point is, is that becoming spiritually strong is not all that different in that if we're going to be spiritually strong, we need to put in time too. Our strength comes from him, but we still need to spend time with him. We still need to take in his word. We need to meditate on scripture. We need to know scripture. We need to internalize scripture. We need to write it on the tablet of our hearts. We need to commune with God. We need to fellowship with him. We need to draw close to him in prayer. As we do these things, he is faithful to strengthen us. So Paul says, become strong. Now, <clears throat> I want us to just meditate on these last two commands that Paul has given the Corinthians. He says, be brave, be strong. I think that Paul intends for these commands to be taken together. You see, going all the way back into the Old Testament, God has over and over and over again called, commanded his leaders and his people to be strong and courageous. God commanded Joshua, who was succeeding Moses, uh, as he was about to take the people into the promised land. God commands him. We read in Deuteronomy 31, Joshua, son of, the Lord commanded Joshua, son of Nun, and said, be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give to them. I will be with you. So there's an emphasis on what God will do. He is the one that promised them the land. He is the one who will accomplish it, but he commands them yet to be strong and courageous. 
In 2 Samuel, we see Joab and his brother Abishai surrounded and flanked on both sides by the Ammonites and by the Syrians. And Joab turns to his brother Abishai and he commands him, he says, Be strong and let us fight bravely, strong and courageous for our people in the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is right in his sight. In the Psalms, we see David uh, exhort the people of Israel in the exact same way. Psalm 31, verses 23 through 24, David writes, Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful and abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Then he says this, he says, Be strong and let your heart take courage. Be strong and courageous, all you who wait on the Lord. Over and over and over again, God's people are commanded to be strong and courageous. And so what does Paul do here? He recapitulates, he rehearses, reinforces that theme for the Corinthians. But here's the thing. Think about us today. Think about those Corinthians then. Unlike Joshua, God has not commanded us to invade and conquer the promised land. Rather, Jesus has commanded us to go get the nations. He has commanded us to invade the kingdom of darkness as the salt and light of this world. He's commanded us to break down the gates of hell and rescue its captives with the gospel of peace. Jesus tells Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Gates are defensive structures. Jesus is saying to Peter that his church will go forward, break down the gates of hell and save those people who are held captive. We're those people who have been saved and who are sent to do that very thing. Unlike Joab, we're not commanded to defend our cities against the Ammonites or against the ancient Syrians. Rather, we are called to defend the purity and the witness and the health of our local church. We're called to defend the faith which has been given to us, the deposit which we have received. Paul writes to these same Corinthians in his next letter sometime later. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Those are fighting words. Those are words for us. Tragically, many Christians have put down these weapons and they've surrendered their ground. I'm convinced that If there's one thing the American church needs, it is a Bible revival to take up the sword of the spirit, to read it and to know it and to love it and to internalize it and to export it to the culture. So, not only do healthy Christians last by by doing all these things which Paul has commanded, but I also want us to see that healthy Christians love. Healthy Christians last and healthy Christians love. So in his first four commands, his first four exhortations, Paul has been concerned with remaining faithful to the gospel, with remaining faithful to Jesus. But here in this fifth and final command or exhortation, Paul is concerned with remaining faithful to each other. Look again at verse 14. He says, let all that you do be done in love. Be loving. That's what he's saying. Be loving. And I think that the the priority of this command is highlighted, is demonstrated by the fact that Paul devoted one complete sentence to four imperatives, to four exhortations. We just went through them. And now he's devoting a second whole complete sentence to one imperative. And this is to remind us that it is love that is the true authenticator, that is the hallmark of the genuinely converted, growing, and healthy Christian. All of our Christian activity needs to take place within the sphere of putting ourselves under others or others above ourselves, uh, within the experience of looking first, not to our interests, but to the interests of those around us. 
You see four commands in one sentence. You see the command to be loving in another one. And, and there's this tension. There's, you know, love without strength. Love without strength deteriorates into sentimentality, but strength without love deteriorates into legalism. All five of these qualities are necessary. But this fifth and final command, be loving, is Paul's callback to chapter 13, where he describes for a whole chapter the way of love, the supremacy, the priority of love. He essentially says in that chapter, look, guys, if I have all the spiritual gifting in the world, you guys are fighting over gifts and who's the greatest and so on and so forth, and you're all mixed up because I could have all the spiritual gifting in the world. I could speak in the tongues even of angels, he says, hyperbolically. I could prophesy, I could do all things. But if I don't have love, it doesn't matter. I'm useless to God in that case. Paul's command to be loving needs to provoke us to sincere introspection, to sincere self-evaluation. As as I was walking through these imperatives, this one hit me, and it gave me pause for consideration. How loving am I? I mean, you know, I'm a pastor at this church. I would hope that I'm loving, you know, but how, how loving am I as a Christian man, as a father, a husband, a pastor? Is love my primary disposition? How, how is my, my love evident in this body? Would outsiders uh, view my life as one of love? Do my brothers and sisters view my life as one of love? Now, I don't want to reduce everything to love. We need to distinguish between what's necessary and what's sufficient. Paul, Paul is not saying that, you know, all these other attributes, uh, being ready, uh, being committed, Uh, being courageous, being strong. Uh, He's saying those things are necessary, but they're not sufficient. You've got to have love. He's also not saying that love is sufficient. He's saying it's necessary, but you have to have these other things. But what he is emphasizing is that of all these qualities and attributes and things that we are to grow in, love occupies the premier place among all the necessary qualities in the Christian life. This is what it boils down to. We need to think about this. We need to receive this. We need to meditate on it. Because the truth is, if I don't look loving, then I don't look like Jesus. Be loving. Next, Paul is going to transition his attention from exhortations to encouragements. He's going to shift his focus. Um, So he begins verse 15 With this word, urge, he says, now I urge you, brothers, uh, brothers and sisters. And he's going to offer his first encouragement. And that is this. uh, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, you know that the household of Stephanas were the first converts in Achaia and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. The first observation that I want to draw out of Paul's words, Paul's words here in verses 15 through 18 is this, healthy Christians serve each other. Healthy Christians serve each other. And here in these uh, verses, Paul brings to the Corinthians' attention the example of a certain man amongst them, a certain Stephanus, along with the other members of his household. What do we know about the household of Stephanus, this man and those, his family and those who lived with him? Well, back in chapter 1, Paul acknowledges kind of in passing that he baptized uh, Stephanus and the members of his household. Here in verse 15, Paul describes them as being among the first converts in that particular geographical region. In just a couple more verses, in verse 17, Paul is going to say that Stephanus is one of three men who came to visit him and refresh his spirit. But here's what is so important for us not to miss. This is like one of those... uh, little sections as you're doing your daily reading that's so easy just to kind of like read right past. But here's what we have to just stop and pause and, and not miss. Paul describes Stephanus and his family as Christians who had devoted themselves to the service of the saints. They devoted themselves to service. This is the very definition of honorable mention. 
Okay, Paul doesn't drop a lot of extra names in his letters or this letter. He mentions a Chloe and her people, Crispus and Gaius, uh, Fortunatus, Achaicus, Achilla and Priscilla. Also, they appear in Acts uh, and Stephanus. But here's the thing. This Stephanus is mentioned not once, not twice, but three times. And as Paul brings him up as an example Stephanus is not distinguished by his powerful personality. He's not distinguished by his family pedigree. He's not distinguished by his skill or or prowess. He's not distinguished by his position in society. He's not distinguished by his education. These are all the kinds of distinctions that the Corinthians had been so attracted to that Paul calls them out for. All the distinctions and acclaim um, that that the world acknowledges. But rather, in this letter, Stephanus is distinguished by his service. He's distinguished explicitly by his service to the saints. And he's distinguished implicitly by his service in his home, in his household. And I want us to think about this because for the past 2,000 years... Christians have been opening their Bibles and reading his name. A man who simply faithfully served God's people, who faithfully served his family. So of all the things that Paul could have said in these closing remarks, these these urgent final moments of his letter, of all the people that he could have pointed to, what does Paul do? He points at the guy in the church that washes people's feet. He points to a servant par excellence. But Paul doesn't stop with holding up his example of service. He continues in verse 16. He says, be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. Paul uses these words, be subject. Those two words, be subject Uh, translates one Greek verb, um, which essentially means submit. It, 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 It literally means to position yourself under or below, to, to order yourself below, to put yourself in a place below. So Paul is telling them, place yourselves voluntarily under the authority of someone else whose life is marked by service. Someone like our friend, Stephanus. And so that leads to our next observation from this text. Church, healthy Christians submit to each other. Healthy Christians submit to each other. Paul says, be subject to those like Stephanus, to those who work and labor to serve God's people. I think that there's a certain sense of irony here in that Paul is calling the Corinthians to be voluntarily submitted to those people in their church, not who have raced to the top, but who have raced to the bottom, who have raced to service. And this, of course, is the cruciform pattern of the Christian life. This, of course, is the pattern set by Jesus, who who took upon himself human nature, being the eternal son. Jesus raced to the bottom. He was found in likeness as man. Okay, he became obedient to death, Paul tells us in Philippians 2. Jesus raced to the bottom. And what does Paul say in Philippians 2? He says, and God highly exalted him. The example of Stephanus and those like him stands in the starkest possible contrast to the philosophers and the sophists and the rhetoricians, and all of the impressive people that the Corinthians had been so enamored with, which Paul calls out back in chapter 1. Paul's saying to them, guys, in God's economy, it's the Stephanus that is exalted, not the Socrates. It's the Stephanus whose name is recorded in the Bible for Christians to learn from for over 2,000 years now and, and until Jesus comes back. I want us to think about this. This letter opens with Paul telling them not to identify with the people who are impressive in the world, 
with the philosophers, with the rhetoricians, with, with those who have all the credentials, with those who have status and, and honor. He says, don't identify with them. But then the letter closes with Paul telling them to identify instead with these people, with Stephanus and those like him. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, he's driving this point home with urgency right at the end. He's saying, guys, stop focusing on status. Start focusing on service. The chief servants among you, those are the ones that you voluntarily put yourselves under. Not only do you look to them as examples, but you even submit to them as servant leaders. I want to ask a pointed question. And I want to ask that you just open your heart to receive this question. Who are you submitted to? Who are you submitted to? I don't mean to imply by asking that question that you ought to be submitted to me. I want to offer that disclaimer. But here's here's the fact of the matter. Whether you're a grown man or a young man, you need to be submitted. Whether you're a grown woman or a young woman, you need to be submitted. If you are a Christian man or a Christian woman, then you need to be submitted. You need to voluntarily place your life underneath the life of somebody like Stephanus, who can hold you accountable, who can be an example to you, who can speak the truth to you. That is the way God has designed his church. It's not compulsory, it's voluntary. This is, uh, this is a matter that I discuss um, in one of my favorite ministry contexts. One of my favorite ministry contexts is um, leading young couples, or couples, especially young couples, through premarital counseling. At a certain point, once we've developed a little bit of a rapport, there's some, some trust established, I'll, I'll, I will invariably turn to the young man and I will ask him in front of you know, the, the woman that he's intending on marrying, I will ask him, I'll say, young man, tell me, who are you submitted to? I want to see how he a- answers that question. I want her to see how he answers that question. Because any woman who's planning on marrying a man who doesn't know what it means to be spiritually submitted to anybody, who has no source of spiritual accountability or authority in his life, that woman should proceed with caution. So I offer us these diagnostic questions to ask in light of Paul's encouragement here. Who have I voluntarily opened my life to? Whose life have I voluntarily placed mine under? Who am I meaningfully accountable to? It doesn't matter if you're a baby, Christian, a recent convert, a new believer, or if you are a pastor, elder, seasoned minister, somebody who's been behind the pulpit for 30 years. Regardless, you need to be submitted. I'm thankful to have um, been raised to value uh, this idea of accountability and in spiritual submission. My dad was very wise when I was young in introducing to me, introducing me to various um, proven, godly, servant-minded men in the church um, and allowed those men to begin to speak into my life as I got older and older. And as a consequence, I have a fantastic relationship with uh, not only, of course, my dad, but men like Pastor Allen, various other men some who have moved on from this church and I still am in touch with, some who are at this church now. God has supplied faithfully. Some some who will never stand behind a pulpit like me. But I know that I need to be submitted, that I voluntarily place my life under the lives or under the examples in authority spiritually, these proven godly servant leaders. So we need to be Submitted, healthy Christians are submitted. Now look at verses 17 and 18. Paul says, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and uh, Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have made up for your absence. Uh, For they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. So this brings out um, the next observation that we need to draw out of this text. And that is that healthy Christians strengthen each other. Healthy Christians strengthen each other. So uh, once again, we meet our friend 
Steph, Stephanus, okay, along with two other men in the church, uh, Fortunatus and Achaicus. And Paul indicates here that these men um, has, had visited him and had refreshed his spirit. What we need to understand is that uh, Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians while he was spending three years in Ephesus. Um, that was during his third missionary journey. And what we need to appreciate is that, is that Corinth and Ephesus are on opposite sides of the Aegean Sea. So Corinth and Ephesus are literally separated by an ocean. So it's no trivial journey that was undertaken by these three guys to bring word to Paul and to minister to him, to refresh his spirit, to strengthen him. They literally went to great lengths across an ocean to refresh his spirit, to strengthen him, and to encourage him in his missionary efforts. But Paul's clear, even beyond that, that these men not only refreshed his spirit, but they also refreshed the spirit's of the Corinthians themselves. So Paul has to remind the Corinthians, hey, don't forget about these three guys, their example and their service. Not only should you submit to them, but you should remember that they refreshed my spirit and they also refreshed your spirit. These were faithful men with servant hearts. Like Paul, they were healthy Christians and healthy Christians strengthen each other. Paul concludes uh, this section succinctly and beautifully, he says, just, just so, so simply, give recognition to such people. These are the kinds of people that need to be recognized in the local church. Okay, now Paul's going to transition his attention now to his concluding greetings and his words of farewell. And I just want to say that it was customary um, in ancient times for letters to have greetings at the beginning and also at the end. They opened with greetings and they concluded with greetings uh, customarily. So Paul now offers these final greetings. He says in verse 19, the churches of Asia send you greetings. Achilla and Prisca together with the church in their house send you hearty greetings in the Lord. Okay, I want to draw out of this another point, and that is that healthy churches love each other. Healthy churches love each other. Look at the churches that Paul identifies here in this verse. He identifies the churches of Asia. That's a group of churches in a geographical region, which we call Asia Minor. And this probably would have included the seven churches uh, that the seven letters are sent to at the beginning of Revelation. Again, across the Aegean Sea from Corinth. So Paul is saying that all the churches in Asia, Ephesus is one of them, and that's where he's at. All the churches, not just Ephesus, all the churches in Asia send their greetings with these men across the sea to the believers, to the church at Corinth. And not only all those uh, churches in those cities, but also um, this small house church uh, hosted, led by um, a husband and a wife, Achilla and Priscilla. Um, He says, this church sends you their greetings. And then Paul says, in fact, all the brothers, brothers and sisters, all the Christians, all the brothers and the sisters send you greetings. And then he says, so greet one another with a holy kiss. Greetings are an expression of affection. And what we need to see here is that Paul is saying that all these churches and this house church and all the believers on this whole different part of the world were concerned with the spiritual welfare and the spiritual success and health of the church in Corinth. And so they sent through Paul their greetings, their heartfelt affection. And at the end of that, Paul says, so greet each other with a holy kiss. As you've received, so you should give. And he's writing to a church that has been divided. There are factions and schisms and relational fractures. He says, greet one another. Not just greet one another, greet one another with holy kisses. It was customary in those cultures for uh, men to greet each other with, you know, a kiss on the cheek. Women to greet each other with a kiss on the cheek. There's nothing erotic implied here. It's just... Uh, simply a display of, of heartfelt affinity or affection, which is, an, which is anch- anchored in a common faith. I think I speak for all of us when I say, I can't wait for us to regather fully. I cannot wait for the day when this room is full of us again. I can't wait to stand outside and to watch you all come in and to greet you, not just with handshakes but with hugs, with heartfelt affection. See, Paul is saying there's a collective concern for all the churches 
from all the churches for the health of this one local church, which is demonstrating a lack of health. There was a sense of mutual concern between all of the churches for one another. Which leads me to the next observation that healthy churches help each other. You see, love always precedes action. Churches that love each other are churches that will help each other. Churches that love each other help each other. I think this is implicit in these final verses here uh, today, but it's explicit in the whole of the chapter 16. Andrew preached the first half over the past two weeks, and he was clear that uh, as a church, we give for the gospel, and as a church, we go for the gospel. Healthy churches love each other, and healthy churches help each other. But one thing that is very clear in this chapter is that the early church was not only international, it was also interdependent. I wonder what uh, local communities of churches could learn from that example today when tragically many local churches just function like independent silos with no relation to each other. Paul's clear. Healthy churches contribute to the health of other churches. Okay, but now Paul is going to offer a final farewell. Look with me at verses uh, 21 through 24. Uh, Paul says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. So as a signal of sincerity and authenticity, Paul tells them, he says, hey, I've been dictating to a scribe, but now I'm going to pick up the pen. I'm going to pick up the quill and the parchment. In this last part, I'm writing with my own hand. I want you to know that I love you, and I want you to know that it's really me. And so from his, from his own hand, he issues both a warning and an affirmation. He says in verse 22, If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Then he says, O Lord, come. So this is quite a juxtaposition. First, Paul calls a curse down from God on anyone who does not love Christ. And this seems harsh, you know, at first glance, but we need to understand that this warning is appropriate for a church in which there are many people who are flirting with the thought of abandoning the faith or continuing to participate in grievous, serious sin. And the flip side of this warning, this call for judgment, is that it places love for Jesus. It's an absolute essential quality in the life of any Christian. You see, a heart of apathy towards Christ is a deadly condition. Paul knows that. And he wants to call out those in their midst who are counterfeits. In contrast with those who are apathetic, in contrast with those who are counterfeits, Paul utters this spontaneous desire for Jesus to return. Okay, and this is, this is a, a sentiment, this is a desire that should be near to all of our hearts as Christians and that shows Uh, our love for Christ through our longing to be with him. It all really boils down to this. Do I love Jesus or not? Do I love him or not? Healthy Christians love the Lord. Healthy Christians love the Lord. He concludes with these words. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul began this letter with a pronouncement of grace and peace over the Corinthians, and he concludes it with a pronouncement of grace. And this demonstrates to them that from first to last, from beginning to end, the desire of God for his people is that they would rest and they would enjoy and that they would be covered and they would be contained in his grace, his unmerited favor through his giving of his son, Jesus. And that the peace of God, that this grace brings would abide in their hearts. And this closing word of Paul's is evidence that no matter what the situation, no matter how messy that church had become, no matter the degree of their lack of health, God always provides enough in Christ to give us constant grace, peace, and joy. And with that, he ends this letter, a letter to a carnal unruly and divided congregation. But Paul ends it with his own handwritten expression 
of love to them. And as we look at his handling of their many needs throughout this letter, what it evidences, what his handling evidences is an extraordinary degree of pastoral patience, gentleness, and love. Paul's example shows us that healthy Christians love the Lord's people, even when it gets messy. So in closing, brothers and sisters, I just want to restate the truth. This is not a casual life that we are living together. Let's heed Paul's words uh, to the Corinthians. As a church and as, as individual Christians, we need to be ready. We need to be committed. We need to be brave. We need to be strong. We need to be loving. Let's take these things seriously as a church. Let's serve each other where service is needed. Let's submit to each other where submission is appropriate. Let's strengthen each other where strength is in short supply. As a church, let's love our neighbor churches. Let's pray for them as a minimum. Let's love our Lord and let's love each other. Let's strive to grow as healthy Christians because healthy Christians give rise to a healthy church, to a healthy Hope Chapel. And we all need to do this together. Amen? In just a few moments, uh, we're going to transition to our weekly time of communion and remembrance. So I want to invite you right now just to take a few moments and to retrieve your elements, to prepare them. But just as importantly, to also prepare your heart. Prepare your hearts for communion. Maybe you need to do business with God. Maybe you need to confess some sin. Uh, Maybe you need to talk to him about how the text has um, convicted you or taught you today. Take a few moments, do business with the Lord, prepare your elements, and I'll be back in just a moment. Church, this is the time that we reserve every week to remember our Lord, to rehearse what he has done for us, lest we forget. This is an act of obedience. He's commanded us to do this, and rightfully so. It's all about Jesus. We are united in and around him and his work and all that his work means and accomplishes for us. Recall that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus met with his disciples for that final meal. And at that meal, at that table, at night, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said to them, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After they had eaten, Jesus took the cup. And he said to them, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. If you have vested your confidence, your hope, put all of your reliance in Jesus' work on the cross to secure your redemption, to secure your forgiveness, to free you as a captive from your sin, to save you from the punishment of hell and separation from God forever, then I ask you to raise your cup in remembrance to him with me. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. We remember your work. 
We confess your name. We honor you. And Lord, though we're scattered in our scattering with united hearts, we join together to worship you for one final moment together, to worship you as you rightfully deserve, you and you only. Amen. Church, let's take the next few moments and worship our King with one final song of praise. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross the cross has spoken I am forgiven the king of kings calls me Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its Church, he is our living hope. I just want to pronounce a blessing on you before you sign off this morning. Please bow your heads with me where you're sitting, where you're standing, where you've been worshiping. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, this body, this family called Hope Chapel. Lord, thank you for sustaining us, keeping you united, uh, even in this long period of scattering. Lord, we pray that you would continue to sustain us, to protect us, to keep us united. Lord, we pray that Um, These words that Paul has recorded in this final passage of this letter, that that we would take them to heart and that we would put them to practice um, in our lives, in our homes, in our communities. Lord, we ask that you would pour your spirit out in revival, that you would save men and women, that you would turn hearts of those who do not know you to you. We pray for a great harvest, Lord, and we ask that you would use us as workers in that harvest. We thank you for your grace and for your goodness. We thank you for this church. We ask for your your continued protection, leadership and guidance and wisdom. We pray all these things in the mighty, majestic, holy, and parallel name of your son, Jesus. Amen. God bless you, Hope Chapel. Have a wonderful Sunday. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. We'll see you next weekend. Thank you for tuning in with us today. We hope you were truly blessed by our time together. We also want to thank you for your faithful giving. Once again, here are the various ways that you can continue to support ministries at Hope Chapel. Online at hopechapel.org slash give. You can text the word give to the number 310-388-3448. 
you can utilize our Alexio community app or mail to Hope Chapel, 2306 Pacific Coast Highway, Hermosa Beach, California, 90254. Stay connected throughout the week. Visit our Hope at Home webpage or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. We want to hear from you. Send your prayer requests or your praise reports to prayer at hopechapel.org. Your pastors and elders are praying for you all continually throughout the week. And if you have not yet joined a mini church, please connect with one of our small groups for extra encouragement and support throughout the week. You can reach Jared Blue, our community life pastor, at jared.blue at hopechapel.org. Or you can visit hopechapel.org slash minichurch. Thank you again for joining us. God bless you. And we hope to see you again online next Sunday.